So hey everybody, everybody that's online, thank you for joining. Um, so we were just discussing, you know, uh, talking about testimony, and, and if you don't re- think that we are really in a spiritual battle, you're, you're really sadly mistaken. And if you notice some things, um, and if you think about it, how often Jesus, whenever he healed someone, that he cast out a devil, he, he that or you know made a devil leave that, and it was that was the cause of it. I mean, you think about whenever um, the his disciples were out ministry, which they had been doing the entire time. They had, he had given them authority specifically because the Holy Spirit had not been poured out yet. And he had not ascended to heaven. So authority was not given like it is, you know, after the Holy Spirit. So he personally gave his disciples authority to heal the sick, cast out devils, and things like that. And they had gone, a man had come up with his son who had epilepsy. That's what we would call it. And, but it was, you see what happened, right? The disciples came and or he came to him and they, they tried to cast the devil out and heal the boy and he couldn't do it. Actually what they did was they tried to heal the boy and, 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 and he couldn't do it. So they brought the boy to Jesus. Okay, and the father, he just tells on him. I mean he just threw him under the bus. You know, I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't they couldn't do it. You know, and he tells Jesus how bad you know this is and it causes him to you know, fall into the fire and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, and really that's what we would do. You know, in today's society, it's, we would deny the fact of a spiritual influence on something and we would fill them up with drugs. You know, yeah. <clears throat> and that's what it, it would be called. Mm-hmm. And you know how the story, you know, continues. And, and that story is so amazing in a lot of ways because it throws it really blows out of the water this whole idea about God's will it, not to heal it, that everybody not be healed and stuff. Just like in the scriptures it talks about this, and, and this is what I, I get. The, the lies that we tell ourselves as Christians in order to excuse the fact that we do not believe, that we are choosing to not believe stuff, things in the, in the Word of God, and what we're supposed to walk in. Like, okay, well, God it's not God's will to heal everybody. And they base that on the fact is that there are people sick. Well, is God, isn't it his will that all men be saved? Yeah. Well, apparently, even though that it is his will that he wants all men to be saved, his will will not always be fulfilled that way. He wants them all to be saved. But we know it. not everybody will be saved, right? As a matter of fact, more people won't be saved and will die in their sins than they will because they will reject them. So, why is it that we think that it's different when it comes to healing? Just because there are people, you know, to say it is His will because we have a good Father. He wants His children healed. He does not, sickness is a product of sin. He comes to eradicate sin. That was the that was the purpose. Well, it's his will to heal too, and it's his will that all people be healed. Will all people be healed? No. You have people that are that for what various reasons, but most of the time, what you find is that the church has lost its understanding that you're the one that comes with the faith, not the person that's sick. It's awesome whenever the people that are sick have faith. And Jesus acknowledged those times whenever it was in there. Whenever they he they came with faith, that was, it was a wonderful thing, but it did not require them to have faith. He had faith. He was the one. He expected that of us. We come with the faith, irrespective of whether the people that, that were laying hands on have faith. Yeah. And so the disciples, they tried, they couldn't. So right there, this is how where people that choose to not believe, because you understand you can be an unbelieving Christian. 
you could have believed enough unto salvation, yet you are still an unbeliever because you do not believe anything else out of it. Which is a self, it shows actually your heart. That you are a selfish, self-centered person who is only interested in you and you getting into heaven. You ain't got anything more. You don't have to think anything about anybody else, about their well-being and what God wants for them and what you're supposed to do for them because the Lord has you to do that. I mean, really, it's just mind-boggling a lot of times. But they would stop right there and say, hey, see, it's not God's will. The disciples tried to heal and they couldn't do it. Well, this gets blown out of the water because... Jesus goes and, and casts the devil out of the boy, and he's healed immediately. So was it his will to heal? Yes, it was. So can you claim, make the claim then that just because a person did not get healed, that, that it was not God's will? You can't do that, right? I mean, you see that just plain as day in the Scriptures, that the boy didn't get healed. What was the problem? Well, we see that. The disciples came and asked him, which is what we, what the church should be doing. Why could we not heal him? Well, he tells them flat out, because of your unbelief. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, if because of your unbelief says that was the catalyst. Because and you go back into Mark. Because uh, I was talking to someone yesterday about it. You see, in Matthew twenty-eight and Mark sixteen. They're both about the Great Commission. Yeah. And the reason is, is that the... I got a phone call coming in, and it's... I mean, sorry, guys, those of you that's online. But what happens is this. I'll wait for that to finish right now. Y'all may not be able to hear it. Decline, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is, is that we have to ask that same question. Why is it? And he said, he told, he told them, you do not believe. So you can be a Christian and believe in a Savior unto salvation that you need that, but still not believe the things that Jesus said and commanded us to do. And he even tells them how to fix it. He said, this only have to say, and, and people get messed up in this right here. They get messed up in the understanding that he, he says, this only comes out by prayer and fasting. And they think of it in the terms of Roman Catholicism. If that's not what he's saying. Where somebody comes and they're fasting before they go in there and they come in and we're going to pray them out. So that's not what he's talking about. Prayer and fasting. He's talking about intimacy with him and knowing him. That is where your transformation takes place so that it ceases to be that you're trying to have faith. It becomes something of who you are. And then fasting, kill the flesh. The, the flesh has to die. And, and that's what it is. That's what the purpose of fasting in the new covenant is. So he tells them that. But all in all, to say that, what we did, because I couldn't just leave it at that one spot, notice what it was. It was a devil that was causing these problems. So yesterday we were in Mint Hill with a friend of mine whose child was born, she's four months old, precious little baby. Five. Five now. And she's been over four months in ICU. Yeah, spent four months in ICU because she had open heart surgery. And... The enemy is after them. and and after that family. And we went over there and prayed with her. And, and right before we were, we were about to lay hands on her, a blood clot comes up on her arm. You know, like a big one of quarter size bubble gun inside of the machine. Yep. And whenever it, 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 it did, it, it was completely a spiritual attack. We laid hands on her anyway, and we watched it start to shrink. But, you know, with all the stuff that's going on and everything, they immediately, you know, took her and went to the hospital. So I asked her, 
and, you know, this morning just kind of like told them that we were praying for them. And he told me, he said that they stayed at seven plus hours in the hospital yesterday. Now get this. They could not fall, find the cause of it, nor could they find a solution for it. It was spiritual. It was the death throes of the enemy, of a devil trying to make one last shot to get that family in fear, but to get them out of faith, to not to believe. But I told him before we prayed. I just had a feeling. I said he was pray he was praying, and he said something about seeing the proof on the scans and all that. And I said you won't see them the next time you go. I just, I just knew it was a knowing. It was not, I didn't hear a voice or anything. Just I knew that when they went to the hospital next, they would not see an improvement. But, that's but okay. they would. Yeah. Yeah. It just wouldn't be next time. We have to remember. Scripture says that this, and the church doesn't it's, it doesn't seem to get it because I mean we're like a, a one and done a lot of times when it comes to faith. Scripture says that you know Paul talks about to the church. He says you are in need of endurance. In yeah. Hebrews, I believe, left. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you need endurance so that after you have endured, you can receive the promise. Y'all getting this? Because, see, a lot of times what happens is, is that you have to persevere in something and not back out with your faith. A lot of people don't understand whenever the to it talks about you know the Great Commission, I was talking about it's like in two different places. You got Matthew 28 and you got Mark 16. Matthew 28 tells you what you're supposed to do. Mark 16 tells you how you're on the way. Mark Matthew says. Go into all the world, make, a, yep, make disciples, teaching them all that I have taught you. So everything that Jesus taught, said, and did, we're supposed to be teaching others. But then in Mark 16, he tells you how that's taking place. These are the signs that will follow those that believe. So you, know, you see the antithesis there, Right? Whenever you, we read scripture and we and and we meditate on the scriptures, you've got to look at both. If he says that if this you do this or have this, then this will happen. The opposite then is true, right? Yes. If you and those of you that are online, that's what antithesis means. So the opposite is true. If you do not believe. You will not see this. And he says, those that believe will cast out devils. They will speak in new language or in tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. And, and things like that. So, And cast out devils and raise the dead and stuff. So why is it that the church refuses this? It's like, for example, understanding the difference between what is a healing and what is a miracle. Sometimes they happen together. You see that all, you know, often, you know, most of the time with Jesus. There were times that it didn't. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like go blink, blink, blink. Really? Jesus didn't heal it? It didn't immediately happen? No. Mm -hmm. Think about the blind man, the man that was born blind. What did he do? Jesus spit into the sand or in the dirt, made mud, put it over his eyes, told him to go wash he washed, guess what? He said, what do you see? He said, well, I see something that looks like trees and people walking around, but I can't tell what they are. So he, he had to go back and wash again. And then the second time, he could see clearly. Right? Yeah. That wasn't instantaneous. What about the lepers? Yeah, the, le the ten lepers. He told them that they were healed and, and sent them on their way. They had, and When they walked off, they didn't. there was no change in them. Nope. Except for one noticed. But he came back. And came back and, and, and gave him praise and glory for what he did. But see, we misunderstand something. Healing is a process. 
And you have to think about it this way. Let's say Mandy is really, really sick and I go lay hands on her and she doesn't see anything at this very moment. But what she, what's not seen is that she was heading toward death and suddenly it's now turned around and, and going in the opposite direction. Healing. The one that the, the, the boy that the Lord raised from the dead through me. I laid hands on him. Not you wouldn't see it didn't see anything at that very moment. I left. But right after I left, he wakes up. Comes out and comes out of being in a brain dead situation. So but a miracle is an instantaneous thing. Right? They can happen together where you have a miracle and a healing at the same time. But it promise, the promise that we have isn't miracles. Its promise is healings. Yep. You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay? So we have to quit looking at the see if I can see something. And that's how I measure whether I'm doing it or not. That doesn't take faith. Nope. Faith is when you don't see what it is. But you know that it's going to happen. That's it. And so we have the church has to get to back to a place where instead we're walking in faith and not by sight. If you wait by sight, hey guys. Or come over here and sit. Yeah, here. We're I'm live streaming, so y'all can come over here. No apologies. Grab her a chair, will you? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, she got it. She's got it. Yeah. Yeah. Things that, that we you gonna find this a little different about us is that it, this is not a one man show. We all contribute. This that's what it is: the iron sharpening iron. We ask questions, we talk about it. People, every, other than me, give input and stuff. That's that's what real church, is, real church, the real gathering of the saints. So we were just talking about uh, where I, we went yesterday with a uh, friend of mine whose child uh, is under attack spiritually, you know, and, and sick. And um, when and really what it is now is is you watch the next when the, you're gonna hear good reports out of this now. It's gonna be different. And the thing is is that the church has got to learn to quit pulling back in faith from things that that when we are promised. So in any case, anybody got any questions before we get to talking about some stuff? <coughs> All right. Okay, now don't y'all get shy because we got some new ones in here. <laughs> oh. Has everybody been paying attention to all the politics and stuff that's been going on? Not really. No. Mm -hmm. Let the Lord deal with it. I look at this stuff and I think to myself, this, everything is set up for, for the, the coming of Christ. I mean, it is going to take a flip of the switch and that's going to be it. It's going to and it happened fast. And that's why we talk so much about that the church has to get back to a place of being 
in intimacy with our Father and knowing Him and being transformed because there is persecution that is coming. And guys, y'all have heard me talk about this this often. But every so often you will see something new pop up on news. And, and the thing that's always really interesting about it is it's not the big news. It's like a poor, yeah, somewhat, you know, something else. Something else failed, you know, that, that, that tried to go through Congress and it didn't go through because of some obscure something, but it's trying to go through. And, and that's the problem, is that it is attempting to go through. So, just like what we were talking about uh, before, the church failed in what we, we were supposed to do. You can see that starting in COVID. The thing that, and I'm, don't get me wrong, this is not a, a discussion on politics. This is, a, this is a discussion that the church needs to become prepared for what, what's coming. And that preparation it isn't, let's go store up food in the pantry and all that stuff. That's not it. That, and that's not even going to matter. What it is is that where are we at as the body of Christ in our ability to withstand persecution? Because the, the thing that we don't hear often that is like overlooked, I mean really, those who would live godly will You'll suffer, suffer persecution. persecution. And the thing is, is, I mean, how many of y'all have heard, you know, people teach on this on Sundays? Not that often. Nobody talks about this. You've got the prosperity gospel that tells you that you're going to be rich and, and God's going to give you everything. Well, how do you reconcile persecution in that? Well, they never realized that people say that. And Jesus said that, you know, who, he who gives up houses, lands, you know, for my sake will receive a hundredfold turn in the end. He says, with persecution. They break off right there. Mm -hmm. so the persecution is going to come. It is. And the thing is, is that there are different types of persecution. Most people think persecution in terms of like going, like being in China, China, and they can't find out you're a Christian and then yank you up and take you into some camp where they want to re-educate you. And if they can't re-educate you, they'll harvest you. Yes. But the thing is, though, is that in this country, you'll see persecution come in a different way. And, most of, and, and the way you'll find it in this country, it will be based off of your ability to make a living. And that is one of the things, I mean, that is their huge leverage. And the reason, the reason is, and you guys have heard me say it before, is that in this country, the church has made comfort its God. Yeah. And we'll do anything we can do to not mess up comfort. We, won't, we don't want to have anybody do anything or say anything um, or... Uh, it's going to get us out of the way. That's why you have so many denominations that are deny the things of Scripture because it requires a responsibility. We don't want to do it because that asks something of us. You have to give up your life instead of that, that age-old lie. Well, did you make Jesus a part of your life? He never told you to make Him a part of your life. He told you to crucify your old life and that you take up His life. It all becomes his life. It is all him or none of him. So we, we have that problem. And, and see, the thing that you, it used to be is that the government did not know. The church was the big unknown factor for the government. They were unsure just how far they could push the church and, 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 and control it. Well, they don't know. Back in whenever COVID came in, instead of us being the city set on a hill, we caved in and looked just like the world. We closed down everything. Yeah. And the government, the funny thing is, is that the government actually never told the church to shut down. Nope. It just said, we think that uh, we might do this. And then the church just caved into it. So if they wanted to know just how far now that they can take that church well, they found out. 
Mm -hmm. that there's not going to be a whole lot of resistance. So one of the things is that if you look at Matthew 5 in verse 13, this is where Jesus talks about this. You are the salt of the earth. But then he asks the question, see, just like David was talking about a little bit ago on, on where we stop somewhere along the lines, you know, in, whenever we, uh, we quit talking about the, the whole scripture and what he's talking about. Because see, the meaning of scripture has to come through con through context. So it, and so you can't understand the context if you cut something off mid mid sentence, mid verse. You know, get I got one verse in there. There's very few standalone verses in this. But you say you are the salt of the earth, and we stop there. But you don't hear the rest of it. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on underfoot. So whenever he's talking about this, he's explaining to you not just the fact that you are the salt of the earth, but why it, you know what it is if you do not remain the salt of the earth. If you do not continue to be his, transformed, shining, looking like Jesus, and standing even whenever everything around us is doesn't look like that's going the way that we should be doing, he says, well, you're then someone that's uh, the salt, but you've lost your taste. And the thing is, is that we've done that. I mean, you know, on purpose. We've made that decision. It wasn't based off of the fact that, that somebody did it to us. We made the decision to do that. He goes on, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor can the people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But it on a, put it on a stand and it gives light to all the house. So he's telling you, there is not, you are not just this, but there's a purpose behind what you're doing and who you are. You're not to be just, well, we are the light of the world and the salt of the world, but if you're not doing anything, if you're not His and transformed and you're living a life in such a way that you're uncompromised, you will not give in and you will stand on the things of the Lord regardless of what other people are telling you, regardless of how uncomfortable it is then you're basically the lamp that it, that's been that's had a basket put in. I mean this the, the question that, that really comes to my mind in, in these things is how have we come to disregard all of this stuff? I mean it's almost like we've gotten we've cherry picked a couple of verses that sounded good that just won't in any way bother somebody who's not born again. And we've made that the doctrine of the church today. You know, you think about it. That's You can't say sin is a sin because you may offend somebody. You can't say that this is not right because, well, I'm born this way. Well, of course, we're all born sinners. That's not an excuse. You know? The thing that just like with every other sin, you have the person has to understand you are not that sin, which is what the world tries to convince people of. Because if you believe that you're the sin, there can't anybody say anything against the sin because then it's a personal attack. Right? You are not the sum of your sins. Right? That's not your identity. Your identity's already been bought and paid for. He goes on to talk about this and um, about the way that you see yourself. And he he starts on this, and we'll, we'll start first in uh, look here, in Matthew six, the next chapter of. Starting in verse nineteen. Tammy and I was talking about this, the first part of this verse the other day. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on the earth where the moth and the rust destroy 
and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor, nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in. For where your treasure is, there is where your heart is also. That last sentence is a doozy, isn't it? And I, it, it, people think I'm picking on prosperity gospel. Well, I am picking on it because it's a false doctrine. You think about it. What are they constantly teaching? Chasing after blessings. Chasing after the blessings. money. Chasing after blessings. Well, where's your heart at then? It's on the earth. Yeah. Right there's where it is. He goes, that this is this is something that was a resounding thing to me about it. Is it this and you know, again, you hear me talk about reconciling scripture. Scripture does not contradict itself. So Whenever you look at this right here and you're taking something else, I mean, somebody else is taking a scriptures out of context and they're trying to make some kind of doctrine such as what they do with prosperity gospel, then you, you see something like this and you go, well, how do you, can you reconcile these two things? Okay? God blesses, but we're not to chase after the blessing because that's where your heart is. If you're chasing after blessings all the time, it's not God you're chasing after. It's what He can do for you. That is the problem. He says, now, now get this. That's where your treasure is. But He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on the earth. So what is He saying? He's saying your life needs to be, you lay it down. Because that's what Jesus said, right? If you would be my disciple, He gives, he gives three steps. That you can't get out of. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow me. That In that order. Because you can't get to the following me. Until you've done the first two pieces, parts of that. Deny yourself. You lay your life down. You are crucified with him. Your life is no longer yours. It is his. You're not making him a part of your life. We, we have that tendency in the United States to be able to do that. We compartmentalize every single thing. You know, I've got, yeah. my, I've got my little box in my closet for me to go and, and that I go play and, and that, that my little sports, you know, my work box. Oh, and there's my, re my religion box on Sundays. You know, we compartmentalize it and we don't let them interfere with each other, you know. We get up on Sunday, we get our religion thing out, we take that down, we come home, put it back up there, and then we go back and do our own thing again. Well, you're never told that's okay. You have to you have to lay your life down. Everything has to be birthed out of who you've been transformed into. Everything. That's why why Jesus said, or well, Jesus said through, through Paul, but that's why he talks about in First Corinthians 13, where he says, "If I speak in the languages of men or angels, but I haven't been transformed into love." It means nothing. If I have all of the faith, where I can cast out cast mountains into sea, into the sea, but I haven't been transformed into love, it means nothing. In other words, he's saying, if everything that I'm doing is not being birthed out of being transformed into love, it's worthless. It doesn't mean anything to me, to God, because that's what we want, right? I mean, we we want to bring Him glory, bear fruit for Him, but we want to lay up treasures in heaven. But if you're if it's not coming from the right place, because you you know you can live a life in Christ that, and be very religious and never been transformed. That's why what Joe and I were talking about last night. There that's why you see people who've been born again for 50 years that still look and act just like they're in the world. That are still babies in Christ. I call them baby humans. They're great big 50-year-old people, you know, been born again 50 years and still wearing pampers. <laughs> and that's what it is, what you have. I mean, but they act that way. Why? Because they have not been transformed. They have not become loved. They, they have not understood that it's not just to get you a ticket into heaven. That is a selfish, self-centered religion. And when you're not transformed, the only thing that you have then is is a religious duty that you will attempt to be doing. That's where some of all these sayings that sound so spiritual. What would Jesus do? He said, why are you even asking? If you're transformed, you don't even have to ask that question. 
You don't have to sit there and think about what Jesus would do. You just do it because that's who you are now. That's who you, what you've been transformed into. But what do we have? We have people who live a life that looks just like the world. And now you have people that come in and they are like they're wolves in the pulpit. And like, for example, I'll just I'll lay it straight out there. You guys have heard me say it before. This this stuff with what you see on prosperity gospel is a con game. It's nothing more than a pyramid scheme. The guy at the top is getting all the money. And he keeps selling this to you. Oh, I get it, it just amazes me. I mean, I was in sales for a lot of my years of my life until the Lord told me I had to quit doing that. And I, I mean, the things that you learn, what, what is that book, How to Make Friends? And Oh, uh, Mr. Carnegie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a, oh, yeah. golly. I, 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 learned, I read yeah. that thing. And as Tammy said, I could talk a cat off a fish truck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm serious. I'm serious. I remember one time going out uh, selling car, selling cars that were hard to sell, like Buicks and stuff like that. You know, back back then, it's a, now they're looking pretty nice. Now they're easier to sell. But they two salesmen come up and bet me. There was an elderly woman that was looking at a, a, a GMC. It was like an S10. You know, the, the GMC version of an S10. They said, "I bet you you can't get that woman to jump up and down on the tailgate." I said, all right, I'll take that. I won. Because it sells. I see, that's also why the Lord told me I had to quit doing that stuff. He told he just flat out told me. He said, He said, You're taking a gift that I've given you and you're using it the wrong way and using it to get people to buy things that they wouldn't normally do. And I watch these people that are that are pushing this prosperity gospel and they're drawing like minded people to them. That's why you know, I have very little um, sympathy for the people that go because they are like-minded. Their goal is, what can God give me? I'm chasing the blessings. I'm going to follow God because He's going to give me things, give me money, bless me. Chasing, it's chasing after. It's like this right here. Which one of you, with your father, run around going... My dad's going to give me stuff, and that's all you were doing. So that's the only reason that you were lo- that, that you were around. It wasn't because you loved your father. It wasn't because you were close to your father and intimate with your father. It was because he might give me something. I'm going to. And, and and how long do you think that worked with with your earthly father? If all you ever came around for was that, so whenever you needed something or wanted something from him, does that sound like a relationship? Why do you think that that would be the case when it comes to our heavenly Father? He knows the intent of the heart. And I watch these, these people that get up there and they'll, they use the same strategies that we use to get people to buy stuff. And, and, and I mean, seriously, I mean, just right down to the letter. I watch them in there. The last one that I went to, and I didn't know that's what it was, which I thought was a revival. It was not a revival. And I watch, and I'm listening to the thing that this guy's telling, and, and he's got people jumping up and down, and the songs that they're singing is all about that, what God's given them. And I'm just watching people. And I'm like, do y'all even know what y'all saying and hearing? Tammy was scared to death. She was like, you ain't going to say something. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not going to say something. I could not guarantee that. That, that moment, there was no, I was not going to say nothing. If the Holy Spirit would have said, say this. Well, all right, well, we're just fixing to get run out of here. You know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But all the way to the end, it was all about God's going to do this to me, but he ain't going to be able to do it if you don't give me the, me money. And then when he got it, people all down there at the altar, and and uh, cause he's like laying hands on people and you know all these things, and I'm just watching this stuff, you know. And 
then he's like, now he's got they give they took up all the, the offering and everything, and so he start, he goes behind the keyboard, and he sings this one line that he made up, and it becomes like a chant, and he's doing it over and over and over again, and I'm like, do y'all hear this? And y'all all, all participating. He started going, I got what I wanted. 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 That's what he's, chanting, he's doing. And everybody else is doing that. And, and like He's convinced them it's a prophetic thing that if you just start saying it, that's what you're going to get. It. The only one that got anything was him. Yeah. And he was going around. And it became like a demonic chant. Well, they, I, they got got I got what I wanted. I got what I wanted. I got what I want. And the thing is, it's so sad is that there are Christians that I knew were in there that were not discerning what they were hearing. They couldn't discern they were in witchcraft. Yeah, I just, well, I mean, still. Because <laughs> that's what that is. But that, I mean, really, it doesn't even make sense. It does not even make sense that a believer is in that type of mindset. That we've been convinced. Listen, this only works in the Western culture in the United States. Go over to a third world country whenever where you are really dealing with stuff. You this stuff doesn't work. You can't go over to a place where they they're a third world country and they're trying to find food to get on the table and you're gonna walk in there telling them, Give me your money, God's gonna bless you. See how far that works. That ain't going to work there. So they don't go there. That's why you ever notice that you don't see the Kenneth Copelands and stuff and, and, and people like that go over to those kind of countries where they have no money. Kind of ironic, ain't it? Because if you believe God's going to bless them and bless everywhere, why wouldn't you go there? I mean, we are called as sons and daughters. And we have been made holy and righteous. We have been given Christ's righteousness. We're holy without blemish and above reproach. And we're to be the light of this world now. Our, but see, we, we have ceased to be transformed. And people go, when, you can't, when you're not transformed, you only have one option. Religion. Being religious. That's it. You do things then out of duty. You do things out of, if I do this, I'm going to do this because God's going to give me something. Or I'm going to do this because that's what he said to do. And all of that's coming out of the wrong place. That's just what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. If I do all of these things, and it's not being birthed out of me being transformed into love, it's worthless. It means nothing. You're not getting any reward in heaven. It is not anything that is bringing the Father's glory. You are doing it simply because that's just what I'm supposed to do or because, hey, God's going to reward me on this or give me stuff. And when you say it out loud, it don't sound quite as nice anymore, does it? Because, see, that's the whole tactic about, of that type of sales. You, you sweeten it. You make it real spiritual. Make it sound really, really, really good. You know? And you chase after it. You know? you know, it kind of goes along with that whole thing. You know, the word most of stolen meat tastes better for a short time, and then it rots in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like it's it's kind of like that. You sweeten it up and you chase after something that is not of God. It's not supposed to be done. You're doing it for all the wrong reasons. And most of the time, it's like Joe and I were talking about last night, the church now don't even understand that that's what is happening. I mean, these guys have heard me say this before. The Lord talks to me every so often, you know, and he, and he, and, um, and well, I told Joe last night. He asked me a question, and when God asks you a question, he, it's he not really because he don't know. Her. It's because he wants you to think about what he just asked you. And he asked me, he says, what if 
everything that we have called normal church on Sunday mornings in this country for the last hundreds of years is anything but him. What if everything that we've been told up to this point is, is deviated so much from the scripture that it doesn't even look like it? It doesn't. And, and you, when you really take, take a step back and you think about it and you look at the condition of the church, it, you suddenly start to kind of get in line like, well, okay, well, something's messed up. Because here's the scriptures and here's what the scriptures talk about. But the church doesn't look like this. And so you have to start, when you have the courage to do it, to, to say, okay, well, why? why? Why is the church not looking like what the scriptures say that the church is supposed to look like? I mean, can anybody truly say the majority? Because I can, I mean, I promise you that there are plenty throughout this country of, of church and, and what, I, what we call the remnant and stuff like that that are spirit-filled, transformed into love, people that are on fire for God. God always has His remnant. So, how do we know? So, but the vast majority of, of what is called the church is, is does not even remotely look like what the Word of God says. Can you really say that the vast majority of what is called the church the visible church every Sunday morning is the city set on a hill. And it's the light of the world that is impacting the world, changing the world. I mean, can we honestly say that? Or if we can't say that, then we have to ask the question, why? What's missing? Why is it that this isn't happening like it says? It doesn't make sense, right? I mean, that's God's Word, right? So we know God's true. We know His Word's true. Something is missing, right? So it's much easier when you, when you realize that to realize something is being taught to the masses of the church that is keeping the church from looking like what we're called to be. Does that not make sense to y'all? That... And the thing is, is that's even scarier than that is that the, those that are in the, the those that are the church are not asking that question. Why do we not look like the Word of God? Why is it that He said we should look this way, but we don't? And He's given us every resource, every tool. He's made us righteous. He's given. He's come. Fulfilled the law. He made us righteous. It's not even our righteousness that the Father looks at. He looks at us and sees the righteousness of Jesus. He says He's made us holy. Without blemish and above reproach. In other words, you're not aspiring to be holy. You've been made holy. He told me one time, guys... And I can tell some of these things that I've told these guys over and over again. He didn't say it all over again. He told me one time, he, I mean, he drops great nuggets sometimes. The Holy Spirit will say something and it's like, I go, ooh, that's good. And he asked me, he said, he said, do you remember whenever I spoke to Moses in the burning bush? We all remember that, right? He said, what did I tell Moses? Take off your sandals because the ground that you're walking on is holy. Right? So he said, if the ground became holy just because of my presence being there, how much more holy are you who I live in? That's something right there. But you are without blemish. You are the, you have been made spotless. I swear that's a reference to the the lamb, the spotless lamb being sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And above reproach. No one can come to the Father and bring an accusation against you. This is how clean you are. This is how righteous you've been made. This is how He sees you. He's given us all things 
for holiness, to live in holy, to shine in this world. So therefore, the question has to be, is why aren't we? If our answer is, the church doesn't look, it is not looking that way now. Well, why not? Why are we not looking this way? And the answer comes back to one simple thing. Transformation. You're going to have, we, <coughs> the church has to get back to an understanding of what it means to be transformed and how transformation takes place. Because it's just like anything else. If you go and you ask ten different pastors what is discipleship, you'll get ten different answers. They all have their own version or idea of what it is. And most of the time, it has nothing to do with the Scriptures. We think we're smarter than God. Now in the modern age, oh, well, we've got programs. we got classes. Yes, we, we do uh, new believer classes and all that, and we call that discipleship. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is one-on-one. -on -one. And it's about somebody taking you, a mature Christian, taking you under their wing and teaching you and living life out together with you and raising you up to where they're at so that their ceiling becomes your floor so that you can go further than they could. That is the whole purpose of discipleship. The purpose of discipleship is that the, per the person that is discipling cannot have an ego. You have to want more for the person that you're discipling. You want them to go further than you can go. You want them to bring honor and glory to God. That's a big difference in, from what I've often seen growing up in in Christ. Is that see people don't you know pastors that well we're going to raise you up to here, but you're not going to surpass me. Yeah, this is my church. You got to you got to sit under the the vision of a pastor for some time before God will give you what it is. I'm just teaching. <laughs> That's my facetious voice. And that is a lie. Right? Oh, yeah. How many times? I mean, you get, you were in Word of Faith stuff before, right? I mean, yeah. yeah you know you know what I'm talking about, right? You got to sit under a pastor's yeah. vision. For yeah, but they most of them who they credited the Word of Faith to didn't realize. He said, if you don't start from my highest point, then I fail to teach you and pass on to you. What God wants you to know. Mm -hmm. That's what Ken Hagen said. He said, if you can't start, if your floor is not my ceiling, then I fail to do my job. Well, you know what's the sad part is that they, they, they perverted a lot of the teaching of Ken Hagen. In, in, in the, oh, big time. You know, all that stuff, especially on the prosperity aspect of it. You know, they really got off into the ditch before it's dead. <clears throat> but they don't stop because it's making the ones at the top incredibly well. You know, you got Kenneth Copeland with three jets and think saying, I need to have a new jet. Y'all need to send me money so I can buy me a new jet because I can't fly a commercial because there are demons on those, on those planes. I'm not, this is what I'm saying. There are demons on those planes and they bother me while I'm on there. Well, he needs to cast them out. Amen. <laughs> he lives in a 20,000 square foot mansion on a, on a river. How many people do you think that are in there that, that come in there and listen to him have, have received that kind of prosperity? We just listened to one Jesse Duplantis. I played that last week. Jesse Duplantis making the comment on television. So I can say it because it's out there on television. I mean, you said public airways. He says, Jesus has not come back because y'all have not given me enough money. That's what he said. You have not given enough money for the purpose of God, and that is why Jesus has not come back. No. And sometimes we look at that and we think, how does somebody get suckered into it? But apparently there are millions of people that get suckered into this. And you know why? Because we quit being transformed. Because transformation is what brings maturity. That's why we were joking and laughing a little bit ago about being a, you know, somebody born again for 50 years and they're still wearing their pampers. Well, that's why. Because transformation is where maturity comes from. It's knowing your father. 
It's intimacy with him. Being in intimacy with him. And I'm going to wrap this up. I'll tell you, this is how that, that understanding came about. I'll tell you my personal history testimony. I grew up in the church. And so I have sit under all kinds of different denominational teachings. Church of the Nazarene, Baptist, Methodist, Word of Faith, Charismatic, Pentecostal, non-denominational. I've had them all. And many of the things that they teach are contradictory to each other. Mm -hmm. And it, when you get that, it, it, again, God's not doesn't have a problem with reason. As a matter of fact, He tells you that. He says, "Come, let us reason together." God's logical. He, he's not. He, he doesn't have a problem with science and stuff like that. Science points to God. In reality, yes. So. There came a point in my life. I've been born again for 20 years. And there, I mean, doing everything that I thought that you do, that a Christian is supposed to do. I was even trying to start ministries. I was teaching men and stuff. I was doing the best I understand based on the teachings that I have. But it's still my fault from where I was at. And I came to a realization of that. I got honest with myself and I got honest with the Lord. And I finally, one day, I came, I, I got with the Lord, and I said, I really, it's, I call it coming to the end of yourself. And I think every believer has to come to that point in life. They have to come to the end of themselves, where you say, I don't know anything. And I, came, I went to the Lord, and I said, I do not know anything. Because you think about it, contradictory teachings, they both can't be right. Either... One of them is wrong and one is right, or both of them is wrong, but both can't be right. Right? And it brings just total confusion. And and the way the church has excused that, and the ones that are doing it, the denominations that are taking those faithless doctrines and man-made doctrines and, and saying you've got to believe that to come play with us, the way that they do that is they go, well, that's not a salvation issue. It's all salvation issues. You don't even understand. If you say that, you don't even understand what the word sozo actually means. But the, but I came to the end of myself. And I, I got honest with the Lord and myself. And I said, I don't know anything. I said, I told him, I said, this is what the scripture says that I'm supposed to look like. And here I am looking at my, at my life. They don't even remotely look the same. Not even a little bit. And I told him, I said, I'm going to lay down every teaching that you, that I have been taught over these years, and I want you to teach me. I'm going into the Word of God, and I want you to teach me out of your Word what the truth is. And so, and, and the first thing I told him, I said, I don't even know how to pray. I don't even know how to pray. I told him, I said, because because you think about it, this is how most Christians are taught to pray. Father, we thank you. Now, I need you to bless this, 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 this here. Thank you for this right here. Bless and so and so and all this. We need this. Here's our bills for this week. You know what we need. Blah, 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 blah. Thank you in Jesus' name. And we call that prayer. That's not... that. Well, it, it kind of is. It's like a supplication. But supplication is not how we're... That is not true prayer. That should be an exception to, to what real prayer actually is, right? And so I told him, I said, I don't even know how to pray. And the first thing he told me was, he said, he, he, he was going to teach me. He taught me. He said, the first thing he, told, he taught me was to shut up. He, he told me, he said, prayer is simply a conversation. And he said, and if you're doing all the talking, it's not a conversation. That's a dialogue. Yeah, monologue. So every morning I would get up with my Bible and a cup of coffee and I'd just sit in the driveway as the sun's coming up, me, the Lord, and my coffee. And I would start going through the scriptures and I would read something and I didn't and that I didn't know. 
and didn't understand. And I go, I don't understand what this actually means. Boy. And he would answer me. I mean, literally, just, it was like, oh, that's what it means. It was awesome. Now, again, like I've, I've told some people, that if you said that in some churches, church assemblies, God answered me whenever I asked it. They go, God is talking to you. Yeah? Why do you pray for him? You don't think he's going to answer you? But suddenly, I started developing something that I did not understand, and it took me years after that for him to start piecing that puzzle together to what we have right now. And that is transformation through intimacy with him. As I was doing this, and I was being in his presence and being quiet and just getting with him, he was transforming me, and he started showing me in the scriptures. The scriptures talk about this. To, that he's the one that finishes the good work that he started in. So that takes away that whole idea of, okay, now you're born again. Now you got to keep yourself saved. And now you got to go out here and you got to really work on this right here. And you listen to preachers going up there and they give you this pseudo-psychology sermon with some spiritual twist to it. So that it sounds really spiritual. And you think that it's really, you know... Everybody's okay. I know what it is. I, I, I think it's the biggest kid's problem. She's ignored me because I know she heard me. She'd probably hear a pin drop in. But this is how transformation is how all of this takes place. Not by your volition. Not by, I'm deciding that I'm going to do, it, do this. I'm going to do this right here. I mean, which one of you can make yourself have more faith? Which one of you can make yourself love some some more? No. You can't do that, right? But yet, that's what we will teach, right? That's what is taught on a regular basis. I mean, we'll even break down love into its components and go, we're going to work on patience. We're going to work on kindness. And we're, I mean, really. But it's all based on you trying harder. You can't try hard enough. You can't do that. You couldn't change yourself before you were born again. And you can't change yourself now that you are born again. Transformation is where it's at. And that is also where you get to know Him. Jesus said this. Forgive me, some of y'all hearing some of the same things. It's like on a repeat. You're like, somebody wanted to put like a nickel on this little arm of the record so they didn't get past this and keep skipping back. Some of you older people know exactly what I was just talking about right there when I said that. But what happens is that transformation has to come through being in with him intimately. That's where that takes place. And suddenly you start to look at it and you see in the scriptures, Jesus just tells us flat out what the whole purpose of being saved is. He says this in John 17, 3. This is eternal life that you may know him and him who he sent Jesus Christ the whole purpose is, is now we have been reconnected to God the image of God is back in man again now we get to know our father intimately now in a way that had never been able to do since the fall of man we get to now intimately know him and be transformed in that intimacy being with him that is what it's all about. That is where then you start to see 1 Corinthians 13 take on a whole new life. He's, you see, oh, this is in me. Now I've been transformed and become love. He's not talking about you trying to love more. He's telling you you have to become love. Just like in the beginning. You become love because you're connected to the source of love. Now, out of that love, all these things that we talk about is what's birth. I do all these things. I have more. I have faith. Why? Because I know the heart. I know the heart of my father. I don't have to go around and ask, does my father want them, is it his will for them to be healed? Well, of course it's his will to be healed. I know the heart of my father. He doesn't want me to talk to him. Do I need to go over there and... Should I talk to them about Jesus? Would God have me do that? Well, of course, because why? 
I knew the heart of my father. My father doesn't want anybody to perish. It changes everything. It changes even the way you look at the scriptures. You quit, you stop looking at the scriptures as a self-help manual and you see it as this is a love letter of what's already been done for me. Now, this is he's just describing who I am and who he is and who he is in me. I don't even have to worry about it. I don't have to try. I don't go around trying to be like Jesus. I be, I'm like Jesus because that's who I am now. I have become love. And the church has got to get back to that because, see, when we were talking about persecution at the beginning, that is the only way that the church will withstand persecution. Whenever it starts to come and they go, if you don't agree with the things that I'm we're telling you, you can't have a bank account. You can't go to work over here and honestly because you're not agreeing with the things that we say. You're not going to be able to, on the fly suddenly try to make yourself mature enough to be able to withstand that. That was what caught the church off guard when COVID hit. Instead of them being mature and going, I'm not closing down. And if somebody comes in with COVID, we're going to lay hands on them and they've got to heal them. Instead of saying that, they look just like the world. And the reason? Because they didn't. there was no way in this world that they could suddenly become mature in that frame of time. And you'll see it again. You'll see it far worse. Oh yeah, there's coming a time of chaos and persecution that the church is not seeing that there's going to be people who are going to be looking how to get out of the chaos and perhaps there'll be enough people who can really help them. But if you don't have it now, if you ain't getting it straight now, don't expect to nope. be instantaneous drop down from heaven mm -hmm. with a heavenly download. We saw just how quick some of these things actually could take place. I mean, I don't know if y'all remember back, probably about 10 years ago when Greece went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. With a flip of the switch, they took everybody's money out of everybody's bank account. Nobody could access anything at all. Out of any bank. It, it, it was like just what they were saying. It was chaos. People couldn't get money out to buy stuff. They couldn't get money out to take care of their families. It'd be on a far worse time than that. Yeah. So we so we have to be at a point that whenever something like this right here, we're not moved in any way. And the only way that you you're not moved is transformation. That's it. You can't do it based on I'm going to try harder or I'm going to make a decision to try harder. It, is, it will not work because you will struggle, you will get tired of it, and then you eventually will find ways to, in your own mind, excuse compromise, and you'll do it. It's that simple. You might got any questions? There ain't nothing wrong with asking questions. All right, guys, we thank you. If you guys will stop that right there.